as far as the Department of Justice is concerned, the standard to which you'll be held, and they've done the research. Three and a half million incidents every year of stalking in the workplace, physically and cyber. 11% stock in the last five years, which means that it's been going on for a long time and you as the employer aren't paying attention. One quarter of cyber, or cyber stock. This is the research that's done four or five years ago. You know that's well above 50%. Why? Because it's easy to serve somebody out of a, uh, at a place of work and harass them there as far as, their, as, far as cyber stock is concerned. What about workplace bullying? This is epidemic. We've done a lot about campus bullying across the United States of America over the last 15 years. We've really gotten onto the job as far as campus bullying is concerned. In fact, all 51 jurisdictions in the United States of America now have regulations and laws against bullying on campus. Nothing about workplace bullying, and it turns out the statistics are far more pervasive in workplaces than they ever were in campuses. Look at them from the Department of Justice. 37% of all employees in the United States of America say they've been bullied at work, and 12% of their peers have seen them do it. Which means half of all employees have been involved on a regular basis in workplace bullying. Now, not all bullies become active shooters, but every active shooter, without exception, was bullied at school or at work or in the neighborhood, and often by all three environments. So, where do active shooters come from? In part, they come from your workplace, because we are paying attention to the bullying and making sure that we stop it, interdict it, cut it off. Let's look at some case histories. This guy went into UPS in Birmingham, Alabama, three dead. He's the perpetrator. This guy was fired one night at NASA, one afternoon at NASA, came back the next day and killed the two people who hired him. He's a contractor at NASA. That's what he looks like. <clears throat> this guy went into FedEx, one dead, six wounded. He's the perpetrator. Take a look at these guys. This is the face of active shooters in, in the United States of America. The guy on the left looks like your son. The guy in the middle looks like your brother or your husband. The guy on the right looks like my ninth grade English teacher. This is the face of workplace violence and active shooters in the United States of America. White middle class Americans killing white middle class Americans in businesses owned or operated by white middle class Americans. God bless America. So where do active shooters come from? They come from the daily workplace violence, also bullying in the neighborhood and at schools. But it's all one big continuum of stuff. That's where it comes from. So let's go back to the FBI and the NYPD and see what they say about active shooters through the research, the extensive research they've done. Is there a profile? No, there isn't. There is no profile. As we've seen, they look like us. And that's why we have an active shooter protocol that says everybody's a suspect when we go into one of your uh, places of work or into a school. In fact, in schools, 80% of the active shooters are 18 years or less. So all the kids are considered suspects as well. Everybody's considered suspect because we don't know friend from foe. IFF, the military designation for identify friend from foe. So, what does the FBI and the NYB say, and NYPD say about our active shooters? In almost all cases, they're male. In almost all cases, they act alone. Now, that's not a profile, but it's very important for our planning and training as far as making sure people are aware of what's going on. And what does the average, it sounds odd talking about the average active shooter tragedy, but here we are, the average one kills three and wounds three plus. Now that's not 26 like happened at uh, Newtown with 20 kids and six adults dead, but if this happens in your workplace, you're probably going to do the same thing that they do all across the country when they have an active shooter. They close the facility, you lose your job, or you move on, and they tear down the facility because it's such a tragedy and no one wants to go back in there. When I say active shooter, you say school, and you'll be right 29% of the time. The other 71% of the time, it's happening in workplaces like yours. The average workplace in the United States of America, in the great majority. How do they end? One out of seven is arrested, the others die, at their own hand or at the hands of police officers. One out of seven survives and is arrested. So, when this guy shows up and he starts popping away, what do you do right now? When it's all going to be over in four minutes and you are the first responders, do you run? Do you hide? Do you fight? Well, I train run, hide, fight all the time in workplaces like yours across this great land of yours, all four, great land of ours, all four, across all four time zones. I think it's a terrific way to train people to know exactly what to do second by second as these incidents unfold. But again, here's another insight for you. We've forgotten something, a huge step. What about the alert? If I don't know the guy is popping away with his pistol, how do I know to run high fight? If I don't know where he is,
how do I know to run or hide or fight? So we have to alert people, which brings us to the Life Safety Code, the NFPA. Life Safety Code, this is NFPA 101. My whole world is driven by standards. Here's one important standard. The Life Safety Code is in every one of your fire codes, whether it's West Virginia, New York, California, the Life Safety Code is there. It requires every employer in, the, in your state or in the United States of America to alert people regarding an emergency. It's right in their black letter law. You're supposed to alert all your employees. You do that nicely with the fire. As far as fire is concerned, you put a fire alarm, a pull station on your walls. Everybody knows what to do. Anybody can pull it. Visitor, we've retailed emergency response. I walk over, I pull that, everybody knows what to do. Do we have an alarm on the wall for an active shooter? I don't think you do. Nevertheless, it's the employer's responsibility under law required, they shall, not a should, that he alert everybody in the facility, employee, employees, visitors, doesn't matter who it is, regarding an emergency. That doesn't matter what the emergency is. So how do you notify or alert people regarding an active shooter? Think that one through. So it's not run, hide, fight, it's alert, run, hide, fight. So it's four steps because this we can use for an emergency, for a fire. By the way, we have to train our employees not to pull the fire alarm during an active shooter. People do this all the time because people are knuckleheads until you train them. None of this is intuitive. All of it is difficult. None of it's simple. And you have to train your people, which is your obligation as an employer under law. So how do we alert people? Do we have a PA? <coughs> Can we uh, use cell calls, paging, all call, emergency notification system, that's ENS, email, text, public uh, panic alarms, two-way radios, lock up computer screens? Well, we can do any of those things. We can do all of those things. In fact, that's my recommendation in your workplace. We do all of those things. Why? You may say, well, that sounds duplicative to me. Why don't we just do one or two? And my answer is, when there's a guy running around with a gun, redundancy is a beautiful thing. Redundancy is a beautiful thing. Redundancy is a beautiful thing. We've got to get the word out, and we have four minutes to sort it out. 240 seconds. How are we going to do that? Well, we better be redundant to make sure everybody sees us. And here's what's going on, because we have to alert before we can run high fight. Now, what about the active shooter protocol? The active shooter protocol is in, enforced by law in every one of your jurisdictions. I don't care if you're in, White, in uh, Manhattan with uh, New York City Police Department with 35,000 sworn officers, or in Tupatata, Idaho, with the deputy sheriff an hour and a half out. Everybody has an active shooter protocol, and you don't know what that is. And you as an employer really do need to know how that is if you're going to save, if you're going to keep your people safe. So what is the active shooter protocol? Well, in every jurisdiction in the country, it starts off like this. Go into your building, find the guy with the gun, kill him. That's the beginning of the active shooter protocol. Exactly what we want them to do. Stop the bleeding and the blubbering. So there he is. He shows up. He's been called. You called 911. All he's gotten is there's a guy with a gun in your building. That's all he's heard so far. He really doesn't know anything else. And what does he see when he comes up? Everybody running. Now that's okay. That's not panic. That's the run high fight in operation. That's just fine. But where are you as the employer there to give him the situation report to sit down? Where are you telling him the guy is? So that he can go into the building and find the guy with you and kill him. So are you prepared to do this? No, you're not. But you've got to be able to do this because you've got to tell the people that you've called. You called them. You want to come there and, and help you. Well, how's he going to do that if he doesn't get to it? He can get the sit left to you. So, you failed to do that. So there they are coming to the front door, looking uh, at your lobby. Understand that most of these people are young men in their 20s and 30s, high on testosterone and adrenaline. With an automatic weapon with a safety off, looking for a guy with a gun, and you're all suspects. Every last one of you is a suspect. Doesn't matter who you are, the CEO, the receptionist, the janitor, everybody's a suspect. So there they are, walking down your hall. By the way, these are all real images. You have to train your employees. Train them to understand that these people aren't priests. Nevertheless, we read the after action reports and without exception, your employees are grabbing at them. Help me! Help me! I'm afraid! Help my friend! Help me! Help me! You are grabbing at people who are scared as you are, who all know it's going to be over in four to eight minutes. They have automatic weapons with the safety off and you're a suspect and you're grabbing at them. Gee, I never thought of it that way. Well, start thinking about it that way. Because these guys have the guns. 
and you're supposedly unarmed. They aren't priests, so they aren't going to help you in that regard. Your employees have to be trained in this regard. They aren't EMTs either, so if one of your people's bleeding out, gushing blood in front of them, they will step over them and keep on moving. Because their job under the active shooter protocol and all of their training is to find the guy with the gun and kill him before he, in order to stop the bleeding and stop more blubbering. That's their job. Untrained though, your people won't get it and they'll get in their way or obstruct them or slow them down. The very last thing we need in a 242nd world. And then they're going to order you to put up your hands. This is a uh, business in the Midwest last year. This is Oregon last year. This is Chicago outside of High Rise last year. This is California. Everybody has their hands up. So right now, put your hands up. You with the dog, too. Everybody with their hands up. Now take a look around. This is what you're all going to look like for as long as it takes to identify that you aren't a bad guy. Because all of you are considered bad guys until proven otherwise. Now the way we just started doing it in schools, you can see the di di difference between uh, Newtown, Connecticut in December of 2012 and these days at Parkland, people put their hands on their shoulders in front of them, demonstrating their hands are empty and that they're moving along in compliance with the uh, orders from the police regarding the active shooter protocol. So that's probably going to happen because holding your hands up for a couple hours or even a couple of minutes is a long day. But that's what they're ordered to do. You can't tell me. Yes, we can. And if you don't want to cooperate, you'll be arrested right then and there. You've seen those shows with rodeos, how they have eight seconds of time up. These police officers train to do it in four seconds with plastic cuffs. That's exactly what they'll do. They'll leave you there on the linoleum, face down. Without hesitation. Just like this. Because you're a bad guy. Until they're proven otherwise. Because you could have a gun. That's how they roll. Now, you can think all oh, this is silly. No one cares what you think. Not a whit. This is how they roll. But you didn't know that. It's a fatal flaw in your active shooter response. Take a look at this employer. Now that I've made you all experts, take a look at this employer. You can see that this employer, this is in California, you can tell by the uniform. This is in California, this employer hasn't trained his employees. How do you know that? She's not supposed to be carrying anything, in which can be concealed, a firearm, or an explosive device. She's going to get further down the, they call it in the business, in, in the police business, they call it channeling. She'll be channeled down in about 10 feet. I've seen the video. She's going to meet up with a very, very large police officer in full uniform, tactical gear, carrying an automatic weapon, an M4. He's going to point it at her and say, drop that. You can't tell. Yes, we can. And you will drop it and you will abandon it and we will search it without your permission and your presence. This is the active shooter protocol. She didn't know that because she hasn't been trained. The employer has a duty of care to train his employees. If she gets hurt, guess who's to blame? Not the police officer. The employer. And he or she will be sued. And he will lose. Period. This woman here thinks it's her constitutional right to care. No, it isn't in the Constitution. She doesn't have a right to carry a phone. And to a guy high on testosterone and adrenaline who's carrying an automatic weapon, that looks like a pistol. Now you can think that's silly. No one cares what you think. That looks like a pistol to him. In a fast-moving combat situation, that's all going to be over in 48 minutes. And there she is carrying that, thinking that's just, just fine. You can't say, yes, we can. So you can't have that. It's already happened in New York City and other jurisdictions around the country where somebody's refused to drop their cell phone in these high-octane situations, and they've been shot in the chest and dead before they hit the ground. Do we want Jack to be one of your employees? I don't think so. That's what's going to happen in these high-octane, high-adrenaline situations. This guy thinks he's on a break. We're not having a break today. We're not having fun today. So you can't carry anything in your hands. This is a school, a, a university, last winter, not this winter, but last winter. Thousands of people on the university grounds. All of them with their hands up. Students, staff, visitors, parents, everybody has their hands up. Remember, the statistics are on a campus, 18 years or less, 80% of the shooters. So on campus, the police come in, and they can have everybody put their hands up. These are male staff and students lined up for hours with their hands up, being searched by this guy, a detective in plain clothes. He's the one with the automatic weapon strapped across his back. Being supervised by this guy in full tactical gear. He's carrying an M4 automatic weapon with the safety off, waiting for somebody to run. 
female staff and students lined up for hours. We're an equal opportunity employer. Everybody's a suspect. Being searched by the female detective in white pants. This is not some TV pat down. This is here. This is here. Looking for knives and guns in a thorough, intimate, penetrating, upsetting, humiliating search. If you haven't been arrested, being arrested is a really bad thing, and this is part of being arrested, is the search. This is not a TV pat down. Will this happen at your workplace if somebody says there's a guy with a gun at your workplace? Guaranteed. And you can't call back and say, oh, it's a mistake. No, we're coming. And we're going to go through the whole process. We're going to have fun today. So, how do we have to react to this? How do we make sure we don't have a fatal flaw? If you already have the fatal flaw, how do we get rid of it? Training, training, training. In the United States Army that I served in, we had a very, very favorite motto. People do not spontaneously rise in emergency knowing what to do. I'm going to burst your bubble. Bruce Willis does not exist. <laughs> the idea that the untrained visitor in your workplace suddenly rises up and saves everybody's lives are fun movies, total fiction, complete Hollywood. We don't rise to the occasion. We sink to our level of training. And untrained, we just sink. And if we aren't trained, this is going to be your response. People don't panic. Everybody freezes untrained because they don't know what to do. And you as the employer have a duty of care to tell them what to do, or an active shooter or any kind of emergency. So then we have to run high and fight. But we have to remember none of this is simple. My just saying run high and fight doesn't make it true. This has to be trained site by site, floor by floor, room by room for your particular workplace. Please remember what my mother taught me at a very young age. For every complex problem, there's a simple solution that's always wrong. Just that straightforward. So, the generalities are dangerous. I had one guy say, of course we train on high five. I said, great, can you show me the training room? Show me your pop Oh, no, we don't do any of that. We make it real simple. We put a poster up in our pantry, right next to the DOL. Really? That's not training. By any definition, certainly not by the legal definition. So you have to make this uh, specific for your site and for your people. So it's not run, hide, fight. It's alert, run, hide, fight. And is this what run looks like? Maybe. Depends on your situation, what run looks like. But what does hide look like? Well, if this guy's walking down the hallway, by the way, real video of a guy walking down the hallway, probably like yours, carrying that one to two pistols. So then we have to hide. Now, in a classic office situation, I go into the office, I lock the door, I turn off the lights, I hide under the desk. I've done my job, and it will be effective, as it turns out. But who works in a traditional office situation anymore? How does that work if I'm in a conference room, or in the parking lot, or in a cubicle farm, or in a warehouse, or in a hallway, or in a shipping dock? Is hiding in a bathroom a good idea? Can be. Multiple walls slows down around. Most of these guys aren't carrying automatic weapons or, or long guns. They're carrying pistols, which will slow down around. That could be very effective. Can I lock the door? Oh, gee, I forgot that. Can I lock the door? Hmm. Well, you got to think that through, because this could be an ideal place for people to hide. Have I told people how to barricade the door? Because I can't lock it. And what about fight? Remember, if it's going to happen once a week, we really have to talk about fighting. Are we in the position now, as an employer, of teaching our unarmed employees how to fight guys with guns when we're not armed? And the answer is, well, you're going to have to. It's the last resort. That's the way it has to be. But we have to train our people. It's not fight, hide, run. It's run, hide, fight. So we've got to teach them as the last resort. What does fight look like? Could look like this. Could look like that. Could look like that. So how do we fix the fatal flaws in your active shooter response? Well, I've learned that the biggest threat at your organization, it's really the only threat at your organization that stops you from planning correctly, is denial. There's your executive committee meeting talking about safety in your organization. There they are, CEO, I think he needs to go front there. There they are talking about safety in your organization. So, let's go to what does motivate them. Tell me what's required by law. Well, every employee in the United States of America, without exception, I don't care if you're one employee or 10,000, 
I don't care who you are, where you are, what you do, doesn't matter to me, doesn't matter to the law. You all have a duty of care to keep everybody safe. Now, I trained lawyers in full day workshops on duty of care and the emergency response system. Charge them a lot of money, you'll be happy to hear. And I take them through duty of care for eight hours. I'm going to give it to you in one banner. Everything is always your fault. Somebody, doesn't matter if a two or four legged uh, creature that comes on your property, if something goes wrong and somebody gets hurt or killed, that's your fault. Maybe other people's thoughts too, but that's your fault. That's your duty of care. That's how you have to plan and train for an active shooter, a fire, a tornado, it doesn't matter. Now some people say, well, you throw that duty of care thing, sort of warm and fuzzy, no real definition. Here's the definition in law from 1970, the general duty clause, each employer shall furnish a place of employment free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to employees. That's your duty of care. Black letter law. You can't, you can run, but you cannot hide from this. Which brings me to a discussion of standards. Standards are a very important word in the emergency business. OSHA, OSHA regulations often called standards, but there are lots of other standards out there too, from the NFPA, ASSIS, and a bunch of other people even from WSO maybe one day. Standards are an important word, so important that the Supreme Court of the United States goes has ruled for a century that only courts can set the or adopt the standards that juries will use to judge you. So when you're sued or prosecuted and you're put in front of a jury, the jury's going to say, I don't care about this, Your Honor. Tell me what's going on here. And he says, well, here are the standards you're going to judge your employer because only he or she has the right to set the standards and remember, the juries are made of employees or retired employees who think you've created a sanctuary of safety at work. That's what they think. That's what the search says. Almost all of your employees think that you have a sanctuary of safety. Ha! Ha! So, what are the standards you have to worry about? Well, remember, OSHA is not a town of Wisconsin. OSHA the Occupational Safety and Health Agency in Washington, D.C., which has been writing safety regulations for employees like you for the last half century. Now, does OSHA have a regulation on workplace violence or active shooters? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. OSHA does not have regulations on, w on workplace violence. Uh, but here comes the word, but. Let's read 29 CFR, which stands for Code of Federal Regulations 1910.34, which says who is qualified and who is observed to have to write plans. Sections 34 through 39 apply to workplace general industry. That's all of you except we're all the workplaces such as vehicles or vessels. So unless your workplace can be put on a truck or a boat, you shall comply with 1910.34 through 1910.39, which says that you shall have an emergency action plan, 1910.38. Doesn't matter who you are, hospital, a police station, your state capital, your place of employment, public or private, it doesn't matter. And then we come back to the general duty clause. So in combination with your having to have an a, a emergency action plan, the general duty clause, you're there. But let's go back to OSHA. They don't have any regulations, but ah, they have enforcement guidelines. So when you have an active shooter or workplace violence incident, OSHA shows up because it's about the safety of employees and that's their jurisdiction. So they get to show up and get to do the investigation. And in 2011, they published a 54-page enforcement guidelines. In effect, regulations because this is how the compliance officer is going to look at you. He goes through his checklist, 54 pages long, looking for what it is that you did wrong, and then he writes you up. As far as you're concerned, that's a regulation for all intents and purposes, because standards are what get you, and standards are for the judge to decide, and this is the standard he or she is going to adopt when you have a workplace violence issue. Let's go back to the National Fire Protection Association, which has been around since 1896 and has written, one, written one, uh, 300 standards. We talked about the life safety standard. That's in every uh, uh, fire, fire code in the United States of America, your fire code. In fact, all of your fire codes are made up of NFPA standards by reference. Sprinklers, fire extinguishers, doesn't matter. It's all in your fire code with the NFPA being the place. NFPAs recognized around the world. There are other standard-making organizations in Europe, but otherwise, they all copy NFPA because they've been around doing it the longest. And all recognized at court in the United States of America, federal, state, and local, all the way up to the Supreme Court in the United States, which loves the NFPA and quotes them all the time. 
One of their standards at NFPA is 1600, their standard of emergency management, which is that's recovery and business continuity, the very thing we're talking about right now. Recognized by Congress twice in the aftermath of the 9 11 uh, attacks as the planning standard that everybody should be using. Everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, large, small, private, or public. It's also law in California and Florida. Why is that important? Because any standard, whether you're an HR, emergency response, or otherwise, that happens in California and Florida, are recognized world, countrywide when you get to court. Why is that important in the emergency business? Because everything bad happens in Florida and California. Earthquakes, hurricanes, landslides, sinkholes, wildfires, Florida and California are the on-ramps to the apocalypse. <laughs> Everything bad happens in Florida and California. And remember, one out of five Americans lives in these two states. So when they adopt a standard, every court in the country fastens its seatbelt and says, this is how we're going to roll. Then there's the best fire department in the world, the fire department of the city of New York, which in the aftermath of 9-11 has now the most robust planning, emergency planning law in the world. There are standards, NFPA 1600. Then there's the Department of Homeland Security, which in 2012 promulgated new regulations regarding how you're supposed to plan for your workplace. There are standards, NFPA 1600. Then there's the standard of course, the people who write your credit ratings, <coughs> how you borrow money, how you exist day to day. Standard Poor's writes your credit rating. And when they come in now, as of 2012, they want to see emergency management because that's current business continuity plan. Why do they want to see all this stuff? Because they believe in resiliency. How quickly can you come back from an emergency to pay your bills, pay your employees, keep getting revenue? Isn't that important? They think so, and their standards at a PA 1600. So all these very important people, looking over your shoulder, looking for your plan, and you're supposed to have it. So OSHA says you shall create and train plans, and NPA 1600 says it so should be all hazards, all hazards planning. Now what does that mean, all hazards planning? Well, it's not just your fire, father's fire plan, it isn't just about fire weather, it's about all those things. Now I hate slides like this, way too much information. That's my point. Because if you go to page seven of NPA 1600, which you can download for free off the internet, read all 80 pages of it in the 2016 edition. You'll see on page seven, the table of contents for your emergency plan, whether you like it or not. No one's asking you, they're telling you. Now with that in mind, you should know that I've looked at 500 emergency action plans over the last 17 years I've been a consultant. 500 emergency <coughs> action plans. Guess how many of those 500 plans were OSHA compliant? One. You've seen my client list is not the Bo Mitchell storm door effect. These are Fortune 500, Fortune 100, Fortune 5 companies. None of them had an OSHA compliant emergency action plan. Basic law. In fact, as far as you're concerned, I can guarantee three things in life. Death, taxes, and you don't have an emergency action plan. <laughs> <laughs> Does everybody know what that means? That's the state of emergency response in the United States of America generally and at your place of work. Fair warning. I will be candid. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? You want the truth? You can't handle the truth. So let's see if you can handle the truth as far as what we're talking about here. We talked about standards, we talked about OSHA, we talked about NFPA, let's talk about the American Society for Industrial Security. Been around since World War II a standards-making body and a certification body, like WSO. They have three certifications in the workplace violence security business. ASSIS is a big deal, and they have a dozen uh, standards that they have set, recognized they court continually at the federal, state, and local level. And what do those standards say? You're supposed to have a risk assessment of your place of employment. You should look at security management, whether that's security officers or not. Physical security, background checks, CSO stands for Chief Security Officer, SO stands for uh, Security Officer. They have standards on how you're supposed to integrate security officers and security management into your emergency action plan. They look at workplace violence and they look at investigations and a whole lot more. With 12 standards adding up to a thousand pages, you can imagine. But these are standards to which you will be held accountable for at court. So what do you do right now? Well, you've got a lot of people who have set standards that said you're supposed to do something about this stuff. Pages and more pages and more pages. The good news here is 
It's all laid out for you. There's no guesswork here. It's all in the standards. The bad news is you can run, but you cannot hide from these standards. So why are these standards important? And why are they recognized in court? Because they pass the Supreme Court's test for these kinds of standards. They're credible. They're peer-reviewed. They're authoritative. They're long-standing. Decades, sometimes centuries. And they are comprehensive. They cover it all. Let's go back to OSHA and talk about training. Training is mandatory under OSHA regulations. You shall train all personnel, from the CEO down to the receptionist, without exception. You shall train them in a classroom. You shall train them annually. You shall train them at hire. You shall use a qualified trainer, qualified in OSHA's definition by experience and or training. Have you done all of these things? Have you put all of your employees into a classroom looking like this in the last 364 days, which is the definition of a year under OSHA regulations? On-screen training can supplement, says this, in the agency. It can never substitute, never substitute for the annual classroom training. Everybody wants to be oh so modern, and people put upon in front of screens. It's a demonstrated, okay, not really way of training. OSHA embraces it, more is better. But it cannot substitute under law for the annual classroom training. And we've already learned how important that is because these are the first responders. Whether it be a medical incident, a guy with a gun, a fire, you are the first responders. Well, you better damn well be trained at it well. And who's the responsible officer of your organization regarding implementation of the safety regulations in the United States of America, federal safety regulations? as well as local. Well, the Supreme Court of the United States has ruled that your CEO is the responsible party, civilly, personally, and criminally. In two cases over the last 70 years, the Supreme Court has ruled that the CEO of your organization is the responsible party, including criminal responsibility. So this is not something you have cooked up to embarrass everybody today. So he or she could turn in their blue suit for an orange jumpsuit. And the Supreme Court went on to say in their, in, their, uh, uh, in their decisions, by the way, short sentences, small words, no Latin. Anybody can read it and understand it. The Supreme Court went on to say it can also be about directors and senior operations people, perhaps like you. So we can have a whole parade of orange jumpsuits. Now maybe you think I'm exaggerating for effect. I will take on that challenge. In the last 30 months, 11 CEOs have been indicted and nine of them convicted and sentenced to prison because they failed to plan and failed to train for emergencies in the United States of America under federal and state law. Three of them in California, indicted and convicted and sentenced to prison. Three CEOs failed to plan and failed to train. Two of them, CEOs in Pennsylvania, convicted and sent to prison. Oh two in West Virginia, indicted, convicted, and sentenced to prison. Four of them in New York City, four indicted, two convicted, and sentenced to prison. The other two await trial. Better lawyers in New York City. The other two await trial. So there they are, 11 CEOs have been indicted, convicted, nine of them convicted, and sentenced to prison. Here's one of them in New York City. You can see these handcuffed, being escorted by NYPD detectives. They'll be cuffed and booked, sent to Rikers Island, just like on TV, bailed out, and goes back to work the next day. Nice suit by the Oh, and it turns out you don't have to kill somebody or have somebody die, or even injured, in order to be criminally indicted. This is March 2017 in Wisconsin. No one dead. But the word willful, if you're familiar with OSHA and EPA regulations, is a very, very ugly, dangerous word for you. It means you've been willfully ignoring their regulations. They don't like that. They take it personally. So they went into this organization in March of 2017 and went after them criminally. The corporate safety and environmental director, the safety coordinator, and the operations manager. We're striking close to home here. And of course, when we go into criminal, we issue the subpoenas. And that turns up all of your emails and all of your paperwork. One of which emails in this organization said, keep this information under wraps until we can hammer out our final plans of dealing with this issue. You may think that's normal operations. The prosecutor called that obstruction of justice and added that in to the indictment. 
If found guilty, any one of those people will go to prison for 11 to 41 years. Let's move on to Ohio. A supervisor and a manager of environmental enterprises indicted criminally because employees were killed on their uh, premises because of safety issues, failure to plan, failure to train. The prosecutor came in and went after those two guys with, uh, with the charges of involuntary manslaughter and reckless homicide. Ladies and gentlemen, these are not words you want on your resume. These are very bad words for the resume. And once they issued the uh, 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 subpoenas for the criminal indictments, they then found out they were tampering with records before the indictments, and once they issued the indictments, tampering with evidence. So both of these were added to the indictments as obstruction of justice. So, 11 CEOs indicted, nine of them found guilty and sentenced to prison, six senior operations people indicted in the other two cases I just mentioned. Oh, I didn't know you could indict a company <coughs> criminally without indicting people, but you can if you're, if you're the uh, federal government, and they have, with these two very, very large, prominent, billions of dollars <coughs> in revenue companies, put them in front of juries, juries found them guilty, tens of millions of dollars will change hands. The kinds of money that will put your organization out of business. So, a CEO is indicted in this particular case that I've cited every 78 days. Oh, and if that doesn't upset you, let's talk about the Department of Justice. In Washington, D.C., which in December of 2015, reached out to OSHA, not the other way around, and said, we want to jump on top of your compliance uh, uh, investigations and go after the CEO for obstruction of justice. Obstruction of justice. Now, there's a lot of talk in Washington, D.C. that this is hard to prove, obstruction of justice. I invite you to read 18 U.S.C. with Century United States Code, Section 1505, which is the federal statute on obstruction of justice. It's less than 200 words. Short sentences, little tiny words. I submit to you that even my golden retriever could indict you on obstruction of justice. It's just that simple and broad if you screw up. So, if this guy shows up, you've had a bad day. These guys show up after a subpoena's issue, you've had a bad year, or two, or two to five. So, this is no exaggeration. Does your CEO know this? Shouldn't they? Wouldn't you want to know? As they are in denial. And I've seen this before. There's your boss. He may not look like this, but I'm going to show other bosses. There's your boss talking about this stuff, which leads me to Mitchell's six phases of denial regarding emergency response. It won't happen here to me. It won't happen here. It won't happen now. If it does happen, it won't be that bad. If it is that bad, my insurance company will take care of it. And finally, oh my God, why do we plan for this? As it turns out, the people you work with and the people you work for wouldn't know a lockdown from a touchdown. And that's a real problem. So they haven't planned, and they haven't trained, and these are fatal flaws in your active shooter. Emergency response. So this is what it looks like when you're meeting with your boss. Everybody's got their head in the sand. So how do we sell it? The planning, training, the uh, drills, and the exercises for active shooters and everything else. But we're here to talk about active shooters. We want to protect our people, our property, our productivity, our posterity. How do we do that? Well, people often ask me, what's the return on investment? You're asking for us to spend time, money, resources. My answer is, your return on investment is, if you're never hit, our ROI is zero. Thank God. If we are hit, our ROI is measured the tens of millions of dollars. We don't have to pay in a settlement or in a criminal situation because we didn't fail to plan, didn't fail to train. The only reason is that you can be made negligent. So, the return on investment is to protect the brand, protect your people, protect your CEO's posterior, protect your productivity, protect your bank accounts. 85% of your employees, says the National Research, says that safety is the most important issue at work. So they'll see a return on investment there. I have researchers so that 100% of them, once trained, will be confident that they know what to do when an active shooter shows up. We bond employees to a safety culture, build employee awareness, knock down silos. I know, you don't have any silos. Integrate safety into their jobs and still a sense of responsibility and increased employee ownership. I think that's a huge return on investment. Some of it's about money, all of it's about duty of care for you as an employer, employer and it's all about safety. Getting this done is, uh, is tough, but I've learned that the scariest word in your organization, the scariest word in your organization, without question, 
It's not cost. It's not price. It's not budget. It's not headcount. The scariest word in your organization? Change. We say we love change. We lie as an employer. We hate change. It's problematic. It's painful. It's expensive. It's time consuming. Did I mention painful? We hate change. And change almost always occurs because of blunt force trauma from the outside, never by inspired leadership at the inside, because we're all in denial. It won't happen to us. Which brings me to a movie called Jaws. Now, I'm not going to ask if everybody in this room has seen it, because everybody in this room has seen it. In fact, every one of the seven billion people in the, in the world have seen this movie. A cultural earthquake when it was introduced in 1975. None of you were born, but I was there. And I can report to you that every, the statistics are very clear on this, every adult American, 18 plus, saw this movie in 75 days. June 20th, Thursday. And I submit to you, it's all about a movie about denial. Why do I say it's a movie about denial? Well, you remember this scene. There's your CEO, I mean the mayor, being told by the experts that he had a problem. And people were dying out there. And he came back and said, well, you know, I can't close the beaches. That costs money. I can't hire more people. That costs money. You know, I've never seen this chart. Are you sure we have a problem? Because Spielberg was delicious. In the first half of the movie, the first 60 minutes of the movie, we never saw the monster. We just talked about it, like I've been talking about emergencies and active shooters for the last 53 minutes. Emergency, 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 blah, blah, blah until this scene. Stop playing with yourself, Hooper. Slow ahead, if you please. Yeah, I'm slow ahead. Slow ahead, Pitch. I go slow ahead. Come on down and jump some of this shit. You need a bigger boat. You've seen the shark go by your boat, you need a bigger boat. And you don't want you or your boss to be like the captain of the boat in the movie, who for two hours is walking around saying, don't you worry, I got it, there's not a problem here, you're all safe, I'm going to take care of you, until he was eaten alive at the end of the movie. Exactly what's going to happen to him or her, and you, if somebody gets hurt or killed on your premises. So, where do we start? Here's where you start. What do you need to believe? That the threats are real to you, the penalties if you don't do this right are stupendous. You're the responsible party, you have a duty of care. Employees want and appreciate this and won't feel penalized. We have the research on this. They're not scared. They're already scared. They're looking for your leadership. You will lead. You'll be a hero. I train in organizations like yours week after week after week after we've written a plan and trained them. They'll come up to you after I finish training them and hug you. I'm not a hero. They'll hug you, though, and say thank you. You will not look stupid. This is not your fault. You can report to stakeholders. You've exercised leadership. You've addressed the compliance issues. You've done your due diligence to protect them, the stakeholders, like your boss. What's the action plan? Well, the action plan is that we've got to get everybody out of denial. Everybody has to get their heads out of the sand, I said sand, and start running towards fixing this and fixing the fatal flaws in your active shooter response. And we start this off because all the standards say, whether it's OSHA regulations or NFPA or ASSIS or PIC or WSO, how do we start this? We start with a threat assessment. Before we start writing plans, which are solutions, we have to identify problems. So write a threat assessment of your organization for emergency planning and training. And you should treat it just like your financial statements. You have an outside independent person come in and do your threat assessment. Just like your financial statements. If you have somebody from the outside do your financial statements, not because you think your financial people are adults or don't understand the regulations, you do this because it's the law or best practice in your industry. And quite frankly, you don't have the expertise. I'm talking to a bunch of safety people, and there I, I went ahead and said it. You don't have the expertise to do this internally, as far as all hazards are concerned, from tornadoes to active shooters. Inside audits, by the way, even if you do have that expertise, are subject to politics and command influence, which means they're automatically dismissed 
by any third party, including courts, because they're subject to command influence. And politics, they know this stuff too. You think it's a big secret. Ah! Help for you right now. If you'd like a copy of this presentation, I'm happy to give it to you. I can also give you a legal brief on the Ten Commandments of Planning under federal law, the regulations, both statutes, the court decision, everything you need to know about emergency planning as an employer. I also have a legal brief 13 pages long on the Ten Commandments of Training. Again, all the statutes, regulations, and court decisions regarding how you shall train all of your employees for emergencies of any kind. Give me a business card and I'll send you everything. We need a bigger book. Did we have fun today? Oh, yes. Yeah. No, we didn't. Oh, yes. Yeah. This stuff sucks. No, we didn't.